All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lewis Wolfenden with the Energy Standing Content Committee. We're going to be speaking today about what makes an energy project work. And uh, I have a couple other committee members here, Ken Kubara, Larry Bentley. I think that's everybody who's here from the committee here today. So we're going to spend some time talking. We're going to have some uh, case study presentations from three different chapters. Uh, I guess four different chapters with the prof you representing the professionals as well. And then uh, we're going to have a little bit of discussion time and wrap up talking about energy resources available for EWB uh, USA projects. All right, so first I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Energy Standing Content Committee is. So this is a group of subject matter experts, um, everything from electrical, mechanical, a variety of different energy technologies that are used in the developing world. So we're really dedicated to serving EWB USA through creation of guidelines, uh, recommendations, direct service, and educational efforts as well. But I want to step back a little bit and just talk about what is energy in EWB. So energy is about 7% of EWB USA projects that are in that energy project box. Now, there are a lot of other projects that uh, also have energy components. So I think we're a little bit bigger than that. But we're, a, we're a small slice of, of the overall project uh, uh, numbers of projects in EWB USA. So we have a lot of different technologies. And part of the struggle uh, today is to actually cover as much as we can on a broad a range of technologies. So we're not going to dig super deep on the technical side of things uh, on some of those. But we're talking about solar electric, solar thermal, wind, microhydroelectric, uh, clean cook stove technologies, biodiesel, and so on and so on. So there's a, a lot of pieces here. Now, energy, we share all of the same challenges that uh, other international small scale development uh, has. Um, but we also have some heightened challenges, particularly in material supply chains. Oftentimes, we're talking about complex technological solutions. Uh, that are maybe uh, a little harder to get uh, parts for than, than, than others. We're not talking about basic construction materials. Um, that complexity also leads to the need for technical training and ongoing operations and maintenance. And a lot of these systems have high costs of operations and maintenance uh, going forward. All right, so we're going to talk about some applications, do some case studies, discuss talk about some lessons learned. I also am going to highlight uh, some of the resources that we've developed in the Energy Standing Content Committee, as well as uh, highlight some outside resources. And then we want to hear what's been working, if you even know what we're doing, if it's been helpful, what other things we can do to support energy projects within EWB USA, as well as uh, other similar structures. All right, so. We're going to just do a rundown of some different systems that you might see. So solar lighting is one of the most simple ones out there. Solar lighting, you have at least a solar electric module. You have a charge controller that regulates charge into uh, batteries, battery storage, and you have lights. So obviously, there's benefits in terms of electrification, economics, a lot of different things you can do when you uh, can actually read at night. But we have batteries, so we have Commonly, batteries are, are a weekly kind of system. Uh, we spoke actually in an earlier presentation today about this. Um, and lack of maintenance causes these uh, systems to fail fairly frequently. You'll also see a lot of solar water pumping systems in EWB uh, and in, in the developing world in general. So these can be as simple as a solar array, a submersible pump, or maybe an above ground suction pump. Um, you got to store water somewhere, typically, um, whether that's in a pressure tank or in an actual storage tank uh, for a significant volume, and you're using water. So you got these major components. You have clean water. You have a volume and quantity uh, of, of water that's going to be a lot better, certainly, than hand pumps. Um, but you also have pumps, which will fail. You have a limited water supply and a limited solar resource. If you don't have any energy storage, you're only pumping water during the day, uh, during the sunny day. Um, and you know it's a limited supply. So um, those are some of the challenges that we see with solar pumping. Solar thermal, 
is a system that you'll see many, many all around the world, some in the developing world applications. Uh, so we might have a solar collector uh, and a storage tank, or it might be an integrated collector storage system, and we have somewhere that we're using water. Of course, we also need to have a backup supply uh, if we want hot water when the sun isn't shining uh, for long, or for long periods of uh, you know, overnight and so on, depending on the system. Some of these systems do have a limited life, especially in, in low water quality areas. Um, when you have a lot of total dissolved solids and so on, you're heating those up. Um, whatever mineralization may happen uh, in those collectors and, and, and piping may cause some, some big trouble. And then we move to the larger systems, the school size, the house size, uh, maybe the village and community uh, size. So from here, we still have our solar arrays. We still have our charge controllers. But now we have large battery banks, maybe filling multiple rooms. We have standalone inverters, which uh, convert DC to AC electricity and vice versa. We might have the grid connection. Uh, we're going to have an AC distribution system like in a typical home, 230 volts um, or 240 or wherever, depending on where you're at. And um, these systems become very complex. So you can run a whole lot of things, but it's also a constrained resource. Um, you have more cycling of batteries, increased failure over time. Um, and one of the biggest challenges with these systems is no one uses, as time goes on, no one uses less energy than they thought they would. Everyone's needs grow. Everyone's going to be plugging in at cell phone chargers right after the system's installed. Um, everybody's going to want a new TV or a bigger TV or or whatever it is. Uh, so these systems often um, become strained over time due to those capacity uh, issues. And then lastly, lack of maintenance. All of these systems require maintenance. And these require significant maintenance, especially if we have engine-driven uh, generators um, and batteries. All right, so we have a lot of different applications. Um, Clean cook stoves as well, small wind turbines, micro hydroelectric, biofuels. I'm not going to get into those uh, as quite as much. Um, so that's just a rough overview of, of all the different types of systems that we see. Now what we're going to do is we're going to have three different case studies from three chapters. So first up will be the University of Tulsa. And um, Tori Weber is an electrical engineering junior. Um, she's going to go ahead and tell us about uh, their project in Bolivia. Uh, so, as he said, I'm at the University of Tulsa. I, we also work with the Oklahoma East chapter to, for this project. Basically, in 2009, the Oklahoma East professionals chapter went down to Bolivia and built a bunch of eco-latrines for them. Uh, we joined them in a 2010 trip, and one of the things that really came up for them was they wanted hot water, because in Bolivia, up in the mountains, it's really hard to get hot water and if the water is really cold the community members don't wash their hands they don't take showers and it, it's a really big hygiene problem so we decided to uh, find a way to make an easy simple solution for that so we came up with this uh, solar water heater essentially um, so basically all it is is two inch pvc pipe put together in these kind of U's and then on top they're spray painted black to help keep it hot and then they're covered in these in two liter bottles which are all over the place in Bolivia um, and basically that helps create a greenhouse effect which keeps the water very warm. Uh, we included a shower head and a sink in these kits and basically gave them to about 15 members or 15 families in the community they had to build their own shower house and everything, but we gave them all the materials for it. Um, basically, we helped, we went down to Bolivia, we helped them build these systems and then allowed them to implement them however they needed to. Uh, one of the biggest problems we found was that the water pressure was much higher in Bolivia. Uh, when we were building our own, versions in Tulsa, the water pressure was not nearly as high, and so it was fine. When we went to Bolivia, uh, we built one 
we turned it on and it exploded a little bit <laughs> and got everyone nice and wet. Uh, but so that was one of the things we kind of had to keep in mind. We um, had to install uh, pressure reducing valves and make sure that we didn't, the threading on the pipes didn't work very well. Uh, so we had to use glued pipe fittings, which actually ended up being a little bit beneficial because in Bolivia you can't, you have to hand thread the pipes, which is, takes a long time to do. So it was kind of, that was one of the difficulties was the things that you don't necessarily foresee when you're building uh, your prototypes, I guess. So uh, one of the biggest, that was one of the biggest problems is just trying to foresee the water pressure and the pipe fittings and all of that, that tr in country is a lot bigger deal than it would be necessarily in the United States. We also had uh, a little bit of issues with communication, which I think is a lot of what we learned in this project was about communicating. Uh, the, because we were only able to give about 15 families these showers, there were a lot of families that really wanted them. and. They became really successful in our last assessment, or uh, not a uh, monitoring trip. We got to discuss th it with a bunch of families and they wanted more, which is really great and really wonderful for us. Um, but because we have a, sometimes a hard time communicating with them, it was hard to tell them, like, you are able to build these. We gave them instructions, uh, which because of the language barrier, they speak Spanish, but also Quechuan, which is the native language there. Uh, some of them weren't able to understand the instructions, so we're looking into doing picture instructions and stuff like that, that'll help out with that. Uh, but so one of the things uh, we're gonna keep in mind for future projects is doing better memorandum of understanding before we, go, we actually start implementing, making sure that uh, the community really understands what our intentions are and where we want to go with that. So, uh, another thing to go with the communication aspect was that the families didn't realize that they needed to maintain the systems. Uh, we had to, and the nice thing about our system is they're very easy to maintain um, because if, if a fitting comes loose or something, you just have to glue it back together, which is one, definitely one of our uh, was one of our considerations when designing it was what's going to be easiest to teach the members how to maintain. Um, but so again, this is more of a communication thing in talking to the the group and the community and just making sure they really understand what our intentions are and what they're expecting from us. So, um, so I just want to invite you to think about some of the uh, challenges that we uh, we saw in this project. What we're going to do is go through all three of the case studies, and then we're going to kind of open it up to discussion and uh, kind of do a little post-mortem on, on those cases, as well as uh, go ahead and uh, speak about any other experiences that uh, any of us uh, have had as well. So next up is Taylor Montgomery from the San Diego Professional Chapters speaking about uh, their project in India. Am I on? Okay. My name is Tyla from San Diego Professional Chapter talking about the project we implemented in India. The community is called Chakacherla Peta Padapapelam. It's really interesting to hear the locals say that and try saying that three times fast. <laughs> so we implemented first a water project and then we implemented a solar project as a, in a, as a follow up to the water project. So the, the community was ravaged from the 2004 tsunami. They rely on a local aquifer and it became contaminated not only with seawater, but because of the flooding in the region, also with bacteria and all sorts of nasty stuff. So after tons of analysis, uh, we determined that reverse osmosis, surprisingly, uh, looked like the most sustainable solution for this community, basically treating their existing water sources up to clean drinking water standards. They have aquifers, so they have wells, they have war wells all over the community. So we used a, we did an aquifer test, determined that a bore well would be sufficient to pull enough water for the reverse osmosis system. Because when you have reverse osmosis, about half, at least half of your water does go to waste. So we determined that the well uh, did have an adequate yield and we would be able to pull enough water. So we also used an existing pipeline 
from the well located about a half kilometer away from, an ex from a previously, I'd say, a semi-failed EWB project. It was part of the tsunami reconstruction effort. A uh, pipeline project that had semi-failed, we were able to rehabilitate that pipeline and use it to convey the source water to the plant. We also designed a structure and the reverse osmosis facility. And because what ultimately determined to be, uh, let's see, an unreliable power grid to the system, reverse osmosis, because it, requ it, because it, it utilizes high pressure power pumps, uh, uses a lot of electricity, and the electricity became more and more unreliable in this region due to power cuts from the local government, from the local utility, as well as the price of electricity drastically increased over time. So there were seasonal variations in the price of electricity, as well as general increases in electricity. And what we determined to be the most, the next step would be, would be to get them off the grid. Uh, we looked at doubling the capacity of their RO equipment. Well, that would just continue their reliance on grid power, grid electricity. So utilizing their existing water treatment system, we decided to go with solar panels on the roof. I think in the previous slide. Yeah, you can see this is the construction of the solar panels on the roof of the existing RO building. It's a 5.4 kilowatt system. We were able to put the CPU and the batteries, it's got battery backup power, we were able to put the batteries inside the existing building. The only drawback was that it's really hot and humid inside the building. We needed to install fans and made sure that the building had adequate ventilation. We took away some of their window space so they don't get to open all their windows and let the breeze through the building, um, but that was a concession they were willing to make. Uh, let's see, it's a 15 kilowatt, we designed it for a 15 kilowatt surge load. It's got 5.7 kilowatts of running load. And we also trained the community to turn on the equipment sequentially so that we didn't have to design the solar system or, and the CPU and everything for the, for the peak surge. So they turn on one pump at a time, wait a couple seconds, turn on another pump, and that way we could, we could save on some of our costs. Of course, the community, we have very strong connections with, our, with the community, with the, with the newly created water board that was instilled as part of our water project implementation. We have our local NGO, it's a social services provider. So they really helped uh, empower the community and they did the outreach and the education, uh, helped instill why the clean water was important and also why uh, the solar energy would be in a good next step. We got the community's buy-in with the solar power. We told them it was expensive. We ran a sustainability analysis. We determined how much more money they would be able to charge for the water. They have a pay-as-you-go system. It's on the next slide. So they have a pay-as-you-go system for the water. The community members that buy water, they buy a monthly punch card for 150, 200 rupees, something like that. And that money goes towards paying for the repairs and maintenance for the plant. We also instilled handoff ceremonies uh, to make sure that the, the community really felt they emotionally invested in the project. So the ceremonies, there was balloons and it was, it was blessed by the Hindu priest and it, there was lights and incense and candles and fire and all sorts of stuff. But we had really big parties to, to help instill that yes, the project is owned by the community and it's worked. They've paid for the maintenance and repairs they have a, uh, whenever the equipment goes out or if there's a problem, they've replaced tanks that have busted. They've, they call the RO equipment provider directly. So I think whatever we've done has worked. <laughs> and that's about all I have as far as the RO project. I mean, I could go into so many, or, and the solar project. I could go into so much detail, but we have a poster, and so we'll be available tonight if anybody has any questions. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. And there are a couple questions. Should I wait or? No, let's go. You know, I think we have time to address them now. If you want okay. Quickly. I just have some quick technical questions. Uh, for that 5.6 kW system, what's the runtime on that typically? Do you get out of that battery system? James? Typically, one, we, we design it for one day. One day. One day on battery. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what was your community? 
what was the percentage of community investment that he actually charges? Like, was it five, ten percent? So that's a that's an interesting question. Uh, the water project, uh, so we were grandfathered in for the water component of the project. We did not require the community to provide it, but they provided land and they and in I guess in kind services. Um, but for the solar project, we were not grandfathered in and we were required to try to obtain that five percent. But actually, what ended up happening was we went to the local government and we asked them, or the, our NGO asked the local government and the community members, they went to the local government, asked for the, for the money, 30,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. And they agreed, they said yes. So they came back to us and we signed our agreements and said, okay, we have the money in hand. Um, but then what actually ended up happening was the politician who promised the money lost the election. We were in India and we didn't get the, they didn't follow through with the, with the money. So we actually did not get the 5% contribution, which ended up being like $900 about. And then just another quick question. The community water board, were those the people that you trained to take care of the, the PD system also? Like the, the, yeah, so the, the water board is comprised of the village elders. So they're the respected elders in the community. They make the decisions for the, the plant and they, they manage the finances and the bank account and all that stuff. Um, so they oversee the operation, but we have three full-time operators at the plant and they are trained. And, but also there's several members of the, the belt of the board that are trained just because they're interested. And there's, I mean, there's, there's so many checks and balances. There's even kids, there's members of the families that are trained. So if someone's sick or they can't come, somebody else can come in and they can run, run the plant. Mm -hmm. How many people does the RO system serve? So there's about 4,000 people in the community before and it was designed to, for basically about 3,000 people, and knowing that some people, it would be, just be difficult to convert everybody over to drinking water, per, to, per, to have to purchase water. So I'd say about 3,000 people. 1,500 people were buying water on a regular basis before the solar system was installed. And so the solar system was installed to try to increase that number back to the 3,000 people that we were originally designed for. And, but we're still in the monitoring phases. The solar system was installed just this last spring. So we're still in the monitoring phases to see how many people are going to on-ramp up and purchase water. And what was the per capita water usage designed? They, well, the plant is designed for 16,000 liters a day. And on a per capita basis? On a per capita basis. I mean, they buy 20 liters. 20 liters. That's how much they buy. They have a punch card and each punch on their card is 20 liters per day. And some of the wealthier families, or during the peak summer season, they'll buy two, punch, two punches per day. But for the most part, one punch. And they only use that for drinking. They still use their aquifer for other uses, washing and things like that. Mm -hmm. We had to repair the existing pipeline. It was from the tsunami reconstruction effort. Um, it was hooked up to a government source. The pipeline was leaking. They weren't using it. The community didn't buy into the project. I'm not sure exactly why it was before I joined. But it was leaking and they had taps that whenever the, the water turned on, the taps would just run and flood the streets. So we, rehabilit we cut off all the taps and we hooked the pipeline up to a bore well and we use that pipeline now to convey the water to the plant. Oh, you're saying it was used for, it was connected to a municipal source. It was, it was connected to a municipal source okay. previously, but they weren't using it as intended. It, so it was just flooding the street. Like the, the, it was connected to a automatic source of water, an automatic well or something that came on at 4 p.m. every single day, no matter what. And then the taps just flooded. And so people would run out and then fill their buckets, but then still it would just flood. So we capped all of that off. So they don't have that supply anymore. Yes. I think we got really lucky that we found a, a for-profit but a social enterprise-based. Uh, solar contractor, their name is Selco, so they're located in India, and they, they 
implement projects for schools, for uh, government buildings, I mean all sorts of, but it's all socially, um, it's for social investment projects, I guess. Um, so we got really lucky, but we had a contact in San Diego, our electrical engineer in San Diego, actually he's from India, so he knew of this company, and he, or he found it for us. But otherwise, when it was just us trying to find solar contractors, nobody would call us back, they wouldn't answer, answer the phone, they wouldn't return emails, so if we didn't have that connection, we would have had to have gone a different route. And are they part of your maintenance plan now? Yeah, we have a one-year extended maintenance plan with them. And then after, from that point forward, it'll be the community's responsibility to pay for the maintenance plan with that contractor. Yeah, so it's a system. It's a package system. It's from a company called Liberty Water Solutions. They're a local. So reverse osmosis is readily available in this area. It's what the, what the cities use and what, the, what the other communities use to treat their water. So it was a package plant, it's carbon filter, it's activated carbon, it's a sand filter, it's cartridge filter ahead of the RO, and then after the RO, you have UV and ozonation. And then even after that, sometimes they, they, they chlorinate, disinfect the taps, because there's taps where they get their water. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and hold questions there. We'll move on to the next case study, and then we'll have some more time for discussions. Thank you so much, Taylor. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Eric Bronicant. I'm a senior electrical engineering at Virginia Tech, and uh, our project's been around since 2007. Uh, it's only the first assessment trip, and uh, I joined last fall, so I'm now the project lead. Um, so, what we started doing originally, and the project we talk about, we have three sites in Uganda. So, the one we talk about today is Hope Academy, and that's the one we did a trip on uh, this past summer, and that was also our first trip. So the uh, need we were trying to meet was electricity for a school. Um, they wanted to power their computer lab. They had intermittent, intermittent grid power from Uganda Power, which also is about 10 times expensive over there as it is here. So we went over there and did the assessment and came back. And we installed one system. And then we installed a new one because they wanted to build a welding lab as well. And. I'm just blanking a little bit. Uh, so what really helped us over there was the fact that we had a really good NGO and a really good mentor. So we have constant communication with uh, people on the ground over there. So whenever there's a problem with the system, uh, specifically batteries are a large issue. Whenever those fail, um, as in your uh, talk this morning, when battery goes bad, uh, it can ruin a whole set of batteries. So it's really nice having good communication because they'll just give us a call, send us an email and say, hey, we're not drawing as much power from the panels as we should be. And we'll say, okay, just shut that series of batteries down, switch to the other one. You can still use the solar power during the day and have full access to that. Um, we do, we, initially we had one system, now we have two there. The one we designed to take with us this past summer was actually for a welding lab, which wasn't completed when we got there. Um, and I noticed somebody asked questions about the community contributing money to the funds. All of the buildings we've installed uh, our systems on were actually built and funded by the NGO at those schools. So they have a large contribution, so it, it is in their best interest to make sure they know how to run these systems and keep them going. Um, these are just some of the components we use. And it is, it is really nice having nicer, these Xantrex components are really nice because um, so again, with the batteries, you want to keep a certain level of depth um, when you're doing your charging cycles, and they will cut off at 50%, so that way it'll prolong the battery, uh, battery life, and we can continue to use that system and also reduce their costs for replacing those batteries because they, they are expensive over there and sometimes hard to get a hold of. Um, one of the biggest problems is you never really know how much they're going to use day to day. Uh, one day they could, you could have perfect sunlight all day, they might use a computer lab for a little bit and never even touch the battery storage. So that's a great thing because again the charge controllers will just cut off charging, you'll have a fully charged set of batteries for the night and then depending on how many people are at the school, they may use 10 lights, they may use 30 lights. So we designed the system with that in mind that you never really know that 
if people are going to be using a small amount of electricity or a large amount of electricity and also the daily loads. So what we have is a, a switch inside of the controller room over here and the school staff are educated on the system. That was, we actually spent the entire last week we were there um, teaching them all how to switch over and diagnose problems and monitor the system. So whenever the battery charge got too low or you could tell that, uh, or it was more beneficial to use Uganda power um, because you didn't know if it was going to be a rainy night or if you weren't going to have good sunlight for the next couple of days, we would encourage them to switch over to Uganda power to preserve that charge. And they would just switch it over to Uganda power. Um, another thing is we initially uh, had a Uganda, uh, inverter built in Uganda is a six kilowatt inverter. We now have a one and a half kilowatt inverter because it, again, helps for long battery life. And that was not the greatest piece of machinery that uh, any of us has ever encountered. They actually plugged the grid power into it at one point and kind of fried half the system. So we had to repair that. And since then, we kind of bring our own components with us from the US. Um, the local technicians are fairly intelligent and they know how to repair all these things. It's not a problem for them. Uh, I've, I've heard concern voice in other um, sessions that it's too, like there's too much technology involved, but it's really not. I mean, it's like you teach them how to diagnose, you teach them how to monitor the system, and things will go just fine. Um, and again, like I'd say our main keys to success over there were definitely a very strong NGO. They've been active since I think 2002, 2000, or 2005, and they just, they are, they're very active in their community. Uh, the guy who actually leads it um, lives in Richmond. So we have ready, ready access to him. He does a lot of fundraising over here, which makes it easier for us to travel because um, even traveling with five members, what we had last year, it's still a pretty high cost for plane tickets to get there and back. And um, so it helps a lot with leaving, leaving our fundraising costs. Um, and another thing, because it is a small group, um, usually we'll have the beginning of a semester, you know, maybe 20, 30 students sign up, and then by the third week we'll have seven. So uh, it's very important that we found, uh, like documentation is extremely important. Spreading knowledge from the people who have traveled to the people who are coming into it is also very important. And it just kind of, it works out the people who really want to be there and really want to go stay in. So that problem kind of solves itself. Um, and again, like I said earlier, we spend the last uh, week just doing monitoring documentation, writing up the entire system, doing circuit diagrams so that if anybody needs to come and diagnose something that's wrong with it before we can get back, we try to travel at least once a year um, that they can either shut down bad parts of the system or fix it if they can. And uh, that's all I got. Any questions? Great. Uh, a couple of technical questions. Uh, have you uh, looked at using like a shunt load? For the PV system, PV system for the excess energy, like a water heater? No, we've, we've never really explored adding anything else besides what they're currently using. Okay. And is that a manual transfer switch then? Yeah, we, we actually have a breaker box. It's what the, that big box on the side and also that smaller box. This is actually connections for two systems. And on the left side, that was the old system before we hooked up the new inverter. So what will happen is they actually, they can go in and they on the inverter and charge controller, there's readouts. And there's also LEDs displaying how much power is being used and uh, peak load. So they can actually go in there and look at that. And if it's not like a, a necessary amount, they can just flip off. Because we also have panels lined up in series. So they actually flip off some of the panels that aren't using all of them. No, it's, um, in certain circumstances, it is, is, because this is an emergency system. I mean, the, it, during the day, it'll provide enough electricity for the whole school, but at nighttime, you really want to save as much as possible, especially during the rainy season when you don't so get as much sunlight. System, it's not. During, during the day, when you have good sunlight, it operates fully as, like, for all their electricity. It can oh. completely replace your Gonda power. Without the battery? Without the battery, yeah. You just go, it goes straight from the sun into the inverter, and, that, and it applies uh, for the loads of the school. Right, right. Yeah, ba the batteries charge during the day, so they can use them at night. Right, and so when would, like, what circumstances would constitute a time when you would tell them to not use the batteries? Um, specifically during the rainy season, um, because you never know if you're going to have a good day sun. So like, we, we, we don't advise them to completely use your gun power, 
but to cut back on what they're using and also, if necessary, to cut over to Uganda Power if the batteries drop below a certain... Uh, oh, because then the batteries will be yeah. there if there's an emergency yeah. later. Uh, currently, with the batteries, the new system is 2.4 kilowatts, kilowatt hours, and the old system, I think, I think it's about the same. Yeah, they're about the same. It's just the, the other system, I don't think we have any pictures of it here, actually. Okay, yeah, the one, basically in this building, they built that just for us uh, to install this new system in, and that one powers... Um, most of the upper side of the campus. The other one is uh, in the school building and that powers all of these school loads. So they're on separate things. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions for Eric? Um, so I don't know a whole lot about Uganda, um, but does the infrastructure and kind of the grid in Uganda, does it not support a grid tie system? Um, Oh no! Yeah, there's no there's no kind of where you provide power and they give you kick, like kickbacks for that. There's nothing like that. It's uh, no. Basically, it's uh, the grid is you know it may or may not be there. Like while while we were there, actually, I think they were working on parts of it. But while we were there, it would be off the entire day, and then it'd come on around nine o'clock at night and go off again at four o'clock in the morning. So. It's a, the school administrators are taught when to when it is a good time to switch or not to switch. So that's part of the documentation pamphlet. And we also give them basically it's a day long like teaching tour. Like we go around the whole school and show how everything works, and they are able to decide when or when not to flip that switch to turn the system on or off. Have you been doing that monitoring on it, like with an even even, and just tracking the usage? We actually, we showed, we again, we showed the school administrators how to monitor the system and we get uh, uh, bi-yearly, bi-annual uh, updates on how it's running, so. Great, well thank you, Eric. Thank you for all the chapters uh, for presenting your case studies. Can we get a round of applause for all three of them? So I want to actually circle back and give anyone a chance to uh, ask any direct questions of Tori from University of Tulsa on the solar thermal side of things before we go on to an open discussion. So any questions? briefly describe the water supply. You said it had high pressure. Yeah, they have a uh, gravity fed system. So they've got tanks at the top of the mountain and everything comes down. So by the bottom of the mountain, it's very, very high pressure. Great, any others? All right, thank you. So now I just wanna open it up for discussion of any of these case studies. So, and or other issues that uh, you've had in energy projects. So let me get a little farther here, oh, a little farther back. All right, so this is just some food for thought, but I want to go ahead and open it up for any reactions after seeing these case studies, good, bad, lessons learned, your own lessons learned. Um, what else have you found in, in your chapters? Sure. Um, any reactions to that from kind of the panel before I jump in on that? Uh, you want to you wanna look for loads. Like that's the very first thing.
first thing you ever want to do in assessment trip is see what their load is to determine if either you can provide the necessary power or if it actually requires something like solar to provide for them. So that's what we want to first do. Yeah. yeah. I'd say beyond that, you know, any sim is there any simpler technology that will work? So solar is expensive and maintenance and everything else. Uh, any other thoughts on that question from, from the room or? I know uh, micro hydroelectric is typically a really low tech option when you're pretty crazy and working in areas. Like it can be. Um, it also has a lot of maintenance when you have moving parts. So. There's definitely challenges there in terms of uh, wind, microhydro, and related technologies. So that's a really important question, and you know, every site is a little different. Every, but uh, there are a lot of different ways to do it. There's ways we do it here, and there's ways we might do it elsewhere. Um, so, ideally, you're you're relatively central on your on your power plant um, and your inverter, and you're branching out from there. But uh, each case is a little is a little different. If you can run it at higher voltages, of course, you have a better uh, better way to go. And also, sometimes you can run high voltage DC from a solar array uh, to the location where your batteries and your inverters are. Uh, those might be hundreds of feet away, and you'd have lower wire losses. So a lot of different ways to do, to do that one. Any other comments from uh, anybody else on, on that question? Yeah. Or another question? No, I had a comment. Great, go for it. Um, Mm-hmm, sure. Right okay, so I'll take a stab at that and, and see if people want to chime in. So Eric mentioned load, right? So we have our load over time and we have our surge loads, things turning on. And generally the limiting factor in these systems are your actual surges. So um, Taylor talked about with the India project how they chose to turn things on sequentially. Um, and sometimes you can do that. A lot of times your loads, uh, you don't have that much control over them uh, if it's not a you know, contained load. So you're looking at your surge loads, you're looking at your average uh, running loads, and you're not oversizing it too much, but you also are thinking a little bit about how much your loads are going to increase over time. So those are kind of the factors I'd look at. Um, and the batteries? So bat Absolutely. I mean, battery sizing is a whole nother whole other piece beyond inverter sizing. Right. Um, but certainly that's, uh, that's really what we're really looking at as granular information as you can about what, when energy is being used, how much energy is being used, um, and getting you know, the best sense of that that you can. Um, yeah. Other thoughts on, on inverter sizing and, uh, and loads, Frank? Yes. It might be important to differentiate between your peak load and your surge loads. Um, surge loads typically come from motors mm -hmm. that draw a ridiculous amount of amperage right off the top to get going. Whereas your peak load is just tends to be when everything's on and running. So you want to design for those surge loads, which tend to be, I can't remember the factor we use, but it's a very significant factor, like three times the peak load. Sure. Yeah. 
sure. Some pumps even a little more, more than that for sure. Yep. Thank you, James. Other questions? Well, there's stuff you guys run across in your projects. What are you what are you thinking about? What's what's keeping you up at night as you design things? High latitude, no, I'm afraid I can't, I can't comment on that one either. But, uh, Absolutely. Yes. Good question. I don't. Anybody, any biomass folks in the room? So that's one thing I think we've looked for in the Energy Standing Content Committee is trying to broaden it a little bit beyond. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you, You know, I do have a few resources that I might be able to pass on, a couple contacts, and maybe we can chat afterwards and exchange cards. I might be able to, I don't know, but uh, I know some people who, who have done more of that work. So. Great. Well, I'd like to actually go ahead and move on and talk a little bit about EWB USA energy requirements. A lot of these things are pretty straightforward and things you already know, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. I think we're getting a little close on time here. Um, have to use local project uh, materials. You want something that can be found to, that there's actually a supply chain, right? So something breaks, you want somebody to be able to go down and get a new one. Um, you want a funding source in place for that as well. Um, you have to look at alternative analysis. We're all doing that, of course. Um, you need to protect the system from damage uh, and theft during and after implementation. And then, of course, you have to follow EWB USA. Uh, principles of community development. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the resources that the Energy Standing Content Committee is, uh, has put together. So these guys right here are the recommendations for solar PV projects. So these have been in progress and, and out for a couple of years. Um, these provide you a road map of the documentation process for solar PV projects. Recommendations on design, installation, startup, uh, testing, documentation. I don't like to print a ton of paper, so I think I have a few copies here. I'll probably will pass them around if people want to keep one. Great. Um, and this is also on the website in the member section as shown right here. And one thing that we've recently added is a checklist uh, that follows this uh, recommendations document um, and uh, includes 
we have appendices with definitions of terms, lists of standards, and so on. So um, if you're doing solar PV projects, um, what we're looking, we're, we're really hoping to do here is make the TAC reviews easier for chapters and easier for the TAC as well. Um, Frank or Larry, you have anything to add on the, on the recommendations document? I'm trying to think if there's anything I'm missing on that. It is, yep. It's on the member portion of EWBUSA's website. What's that? Okay, yes, please do. Absolutely. And we're about ready probably to do a revision on it and a review of whether it's appropriate. It's been a little while, so um, so yes, please send us comments and let us, let us know what you think. Right, yep. So the next resource I want to talk about is EWB USA Energy uh, blog, which is EWBUSAenergy.blogspot.com. And Scott Herr, who is our enrichment uh, subcommittee head, does a great job pulling content together. So it's, I'd say, about 50-50 original content from Energy Standing Content Committee members and associated EWB folks. And the other half is outside content that we're linking to um, and discussing. So recently, actually, Scott put together an introduction to the failure modes and effects analysis. It's a great article that walks you through FMEA. Um, I've got a few copies up here if you're interested uh, after. Um, we have Larry Bentley, who is our lead author on our battery operations and maintenance document, which will soon be published. There's already some pieces in it. Um, and uh, so that's a great resource as far as, our, as batteries go. Uh, we um, are also, we've just, uh, I'm not sure it's quite posted yet, but it will be in the next couple weeks, is a, a solar PV array maintenance checklist. So this focuses specifically on the solar array, what's on the roof, what's on the ground. Um, and talking about the mechanical and electrical considerations for these systems. All right, so let's talk about a few other resources. So we also have uh, presented a number of years running at the various regional conferences, a technical best practices PowerPoint, uh, which email us and we'll send you a PDF of that. And then uh, Frank Berg was actually lead on um, a paper. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that is? And And I did print out a few hard copies, so if you're interested in that, come uh, check them out afterwards. So yeah, so what else does Energy Standing Content Committee do? So here's our email. I've got cards up here. Shoot us an email. We can help with informal consultation. If you're a chapter wondering, how do I size an inverter? Like, send us an email. We'll get a couple experts involved. We can jump on Skype or the phone or email and help you out. Um, we're also looking to do a little more in the future of if a uh, chapter has, has gotten a tack hold or been denied, we can kind of powwow with you and figure out what uh, we might be able to do to help you uh, get on, on the path to an approval. Um, we do informal mentorship. We also, many of us also mentor projects, so if you need a specific energy uh, mentor, um, we may be able to travel, uh, certainly. Larry's traveled dozen, almost a dozen times, I think, on, on mentoring projects. And then we can also provide resources. So you know, the committee members have decades of experience in energy. So if we don't know, we know the person who knows or, or the uh, resource that we can pass along. All right, so that's about it. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, everyone, for sharing. Uh, thank you for the chapters who shared case studies or photos um, and to other ESCC members. As well, and particularly to Ken Kubarak, who did a great job uh, pulling together a lot of the uh, case study information. So thanks so much, and uh, have a good rest of your afternoon.
Thank you.